Welcome to the Fishing Daily Podcast with me, Oliver McBride. Today, I'm joined by the CEO of the Irish Fish Producers and Exporters Association, Brendan Byrne. Welcome, Brendan. Thank you very much, Oliver. Glad to be here. Brendan, uh, we seem to be in a little bit of controversy at the moment with uh, the Norwegian mackerel situation. Um, we've seen two boats landing mackerel into a processing plant in Killy Beggs. What, what's happening? Out there, you were down there this morning. Uh, yeah, I was there when the boats started to offload their catch to the processor in Kitty Beggs. Things are running extremely smoothly as I speak. And the most important thing is that there's 30 to 35 people working today that weren't working last week because there was no fish to process. Now, there's other dimensions to this, and I'm not ignorant of those facts that the Norway took a unilateral decision in May to increase their quota, which is their right as a non-member of the EU and a member of the coastal states. They took that uh, decision. I wouldn't personally agree with the fact that they increased their quota by 100,000 ton. Uh, the problem for us is that the uh, EU didn't take any sanctions, did not take any corrective action. And that hasn't happened since. And uh, we now have a situation where free market forces apply and these fish are available on the market to be purchased by processors and um, that was done in good faith by one of the processors in Kitty Beggs and there's benefits for that in terms of employment and so on. I appreciate that some of the producer groups are um, uh, aggrieved by that uh, but the reality is the, the policy that they now have made clear wasn't made aware to us as processors. So uh, we uh, worked in good faith. We purchased the, the, the catch in Norway and um, it was cleared for landing into Ireland by the competent authority. So in terms of what is what has happened from a processing point of view, we work strictly within the parameters and the frameworks and the regulations that's there. Uh, if other groups have different policies to us, then the format for that is to come to us as an association to sit down and explain the policy that you have. We'll talk that out with you and we'll come to a common policy if that is, if that is achievable. But we can't second guess or mind read when we're not told what the policies of others are. As you're saying, processors are, are under pressure as much as the fishing community itself is, is under pressure. Could we see more mackerel being brought in or is this a once-off? Well the reality is because of the TCA and Brexit there has been no winners or there won't be any winners in an Irish context. We've taken the brunt of the hit of cuts. We are carrying the pain of most of Europe not for the first time has Ireland done that for the broader European project uh, as to the fact, will other lands come into Ireland from Norway? Well, commercial market forces will dictate that. We're coming close to the opening of our own autumn fisheries, and there is still um, 10,000 tonne to be caught there. That ordinarily would be sufficient in terms of the, the need for the autumn fishery. There was a number of choke points that led to the purchase of these macro from uh, Norway, and that was in relation to the North Sea herring, uh, which this year is shown a very strong showing of herring roe, which has led to the that being diverted to other markets that offer premium price as opposed to what traditionally would be uh, the maximum that could be paid for um, herring here in, in the Irish processing sector. So it, it was a unique set of circumstances, but we must deal with the realities also, Oliver. And the reality is, is that the, the Brexit cut isn't a once-off. It's going to be a reoccurring year-on-year -year cut that's going to face the producers and the processors right up to 2026. And thereafter, it may even get worse. So for us as processors to meet the capacity that they've built up and through hard work and through marketing over the last number of years, for us to sustain that capacity, additional fish will have to be sourced. And as opposed to hunting them in the sea, which is traditionally the way we did, we're not allowed that because our quotas are cut right across the board. We will have to hunt the fish through other markets in the countries that have fish on the open market for sale. This is the new reality. And in order to sustain the Irish fishing industry, 
what has happened today here in Quebec's in terms of the Norwegian landing, that is going to become more common sight, more common practice. It, otherwise, otherwise, the Irish fishing industry will go into reverse because we have not got enough quota of our own through the facts of the decisions taken by the TCA to sustain the industry that has been built up through hard work on the part of the producers and processors over the last uh, 20, 30 years. And the pelagic boats and killybegs and the other, other parts of Ireland uh, that land and to processors here in Ireland, can they be guaranteed that their mackerel will be bought for a good price when the, the instead of this mackerel that's coming from Norway? Well, the reality of the situation at the minute is that Norway, through their own unilateral action, have glutted their own market. They increased their supply or the ability of catch by 55% in one year. It now turns out to be the case that they hadn't built the infrastructure to facilitate that demand and that extra supply. So there's choke points there in terms of something as simple as cartons. They haven't enough cartons in order to freeze these products. And uh, so I think that's a once-off circumstance for Norway. Norway is a very maritime focused nation and I don't think they're going to make the same mistake twice. They're going to be better prepared next year and that they're going to have greater capacity with their own, their own processing sector. So in terms of Norway, they, they are always a key pelagic player and very much so now with the extra hike of quotas. So they're going to remain a key player there. And I think in the medium to long term, Ireland is the main pelagic player within Europe, needs to keep a, a close assimilate with Norway. There's no reason for us to be antagonistic towards Norway, that the realities of each of us being uh, players in the pelagic um, fishing world are realities and that we need to be cognizant of that. There's a long tradition of Killybegs boats and boats from Ireland landing into Norway. That wasn't reflected in some of the narrow-minded commentary that I witnessed over the weekend, but that's a fact. A lot of fishermen, a lot of fish producers have done business with Norway and done very good business with Norway. And it's part of the, the fish industry psyche that Norway is a key player in the interaction of Ireland and Norway. And uh, those things can be lost on occasions in the intensity of these vortex that uh, develop in and around social media. There is a lot of frustration fishermen out there because we've had ridiculously poor uh, trade and cooperation agreement which has seen their, their, their fishing just hammered and we've also seen the likes of the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority you know basically throwing away uh, what was probably the only plan that the control plan they had for landing and now they're trying to reinvent the wheel with the, with the new control plan. This, this has to also be a, a factor that's going to affect the processing industry. You're 100% correct. I've never seen frustration levels, anger levels as high as they are, but we need to be focused as to where the real anger is here. The producers need not direct their anger towards the processors here. The processors need not direct their anger to the producers. That's a sideshow off a sideshow. It suits some agendas if that were to occur. That's not going to occur in my watch. The Irish fishing industry are very united and that we are united because we have never been in this position as we are currently. After 48 years of membership of the EU, we are now in a worse position in terms of our ability to catch fish in our own territorial waters around the island. We're the largest water uh, mass in the EU as a member state, 12%. But we're a minority shareholder. We have minority shares in the waters that surround our island. The French and the Belgians have more catching rights for some species, multiples catching rights than we have. That is where our focus needs to be. In terms of recent events, in terms of Norwegian mackerel, or in terms of the control plan, in terms of the TCA, 
the focus has to be at how are we being represented at European level. Time and time again, Ireland has been thrown under the European bus. It's a consistent part of any negotiations. If fission is involved, we carry the burden. It happened in TCA, it happened in 1983, it happened in 1976, and it's happening again through the unilateral decision of the Norwegians in terms of the coastal states, particularly in terms of the coastal states, because it, it is clear that we are the largest pelagic player in the context of the EU coastal states. So what's a consistent factor that has led to those multiple failures that I have outlined? And it is this, the failure of national government policy, successive governments over the last 40 years have not prioritised the, the Irish fishing sector, the Irish fishing industry. That's a fact. The other reality is we need to take a serious and fundamental look at how we as a permanent government through our civil service and public service interact at European level. If this is the subtotal and grand total of what we're getting back through negotiations, be it at political level or permanent government level, then we need to take a fundamental reassessment of how we're interacting and how we're conducting our business at European level, because we can't sustain it. We're talking about sustaining the fisheries. The most thing that we can't sustain, we can no longer sustain these policies that has led the Irish fishing industry to a cliff edge. And what is wrong, in my view, and I'm only the most recent uh, representative in the fishing industry. But what is wrong is there's so few saying that that are representing the fishing industries. But the reality is we cannot sustain the policies of successive governments and successive failures that we have experienced for the last 48 years. One of the bugbears for the industry seems to be the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority, the SFPA, and the lack of control the government seems to have on that authority, they keep putting it off that they're uh, an independent authority, that they can't interfere with what they're doing, but it seems to be that the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority has, is, a, is in a mess, and, you know, the report that they submitted on, on the control plan, uh, the EU Commission accepted it and uh, we lost our control plan. Now they're coming back and they're saying, oh, we're consulting with the fishing industry, but the fishing industry doesn't seem to be having any input on it. Is there, is there a need for an overall sort of like, let's, let's pull out all these drawers and let's reset everything in them so that we can actually start with a proper base? Well, the first thing in terms of the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority, they have a job of work to do and ourselves as processors or the producers and they will always have a fractious relationship because they are the control authority, we're the hunter or we're the processor of fish. So there's always going to be tension there. Th that being said, there's a, a unique circumstances here. Uh, my own view that 2006 Maritime and Sea Fisheries Jurisdiction Act is a flawed document. It set up an authority that effectively is governed by three persons and can, on occasions, if the need arises, be governed by one individual. Now, that doesn't sound democratic, doesn't sound representative either. And coupled on top of that, you have the 2011 Wolf Report, 2007 Dean uh, Morn report, and then the 2020 Pricewaterhouse Coopers report into the effectiveness or otherwise of the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority. All those three documents are clear that there is massive internal issues in terms of government governance, in terms of management, and in terms of effectiveness. That being said, it's my own experience, and I have to put it on the record, that there is some very good and very fine public servants in the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority, and they are very good at their work. That has to go on the record. But 
the fundamental problem with Sea Fisheries Protection Authority is not going to go away because it's designed to remain at arm's length from the Minister of the Day. It's designed supposedly to stay at arm's length away from the department, although they share the one building and they're in under the one roof, which I think is a cataclysmic mistake. And the final thing is it's answerable only to the department uh, uh, sorry, so answer only to the public through the committee of uh, the Marine of the Oireachtas. So until you have reform, and I mean meaningful reform, on a board to the SFPA, and until you have reform of the structures of management and the structures of governance, it's an authority, makes no difference. What can a tinkering successive ministers do with it? And we've only ever seen tinkering, and we see another set of tinkering going on presently. If something is built on sand, it's never going to stand. And the fundamentals of the Sea Fishing Protection Authority through the act that set it up is flawed. And that has led to the situation where we have this reoccurring tension and we have reoccurring bad publicity surrounding the SFPA. Whether it's fair or unfair, I leave that at others to judge. But there has been a shying away by successive ministers, including the present minister, to do any meaningful reform. And until you get meaningful reform, you're not going to get buy-in from the sector, be that the producer sector, be it the fishing community, or us as processors. And I have to say, on a personal level, I have a very good relationship with the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority over the last four months. I have seen a very positive side to them. But as an entity, as an entity, until there's real reform, they are going to struggle to get the credibility that they deserve, notwithstanding the fact that they are a control authority, both for food safety and for uh, regulation of fishing and landings. And that's always going to lead to tension. But they're in a particularly bad space because their entire setup, in my view, is fatally flawed. And that is because of the act and because of the intent. You must remember that in 2006, when the Sea Fishery Protection Authority was set up, it was the same time as the financial regulator was set up. It was the same time as the building regulator was set up. And what has happened with those two similar pieces of legislation? They were undone. Both were of similar nature arm's length regulation, arm's length self-regulation. They were proven to be failed entities. Three successive reports have shown serious issues in terms of how these entity of the Sea Fishery Protection Authority are functioning. It's the only piece of legislation of that particular period and that particular genre of light touch regulation and arm's length regulation is left. And I think it's unfair for all of those that work and work hard in that sector that that is that's the backdrop in which they work through no fault of their own. There is a political uh, challenge to be met, but the willingness at political level of successive ministers, not alone this minister, but successive ministers, is to shy away from that. Either that or they're being steered away by it, by the, the permanent government, the civil service that they're. I don't have the answer to that, but an entity of any nature that's not properly constituted and set up, that meets the needs and demands and the benchmarks of interaction with the general public or the sector that it serves or the sector that it controls and regulates, if the benchmarks of its establishment are wrong, it'll never succeed. I suppose one of the examples of, of the SFPA is, is the control plan. Did you has, has the fishing industry seen any of the report that they submitted to the European Commission? No, we have asked Europe, we've asked our minister, we have asked the SFPA, we've asked all three to give us sight and vision of these supposed charges that are against us that triggered the collapse of the control plan on the 13th of April this year. The SFPA said that they have no difficulty in supplying us with that information, but it's a matter for the minister to release that information. When we asked the minister, he said he cannot release it as minister, it's a matter for Europe. And Europe have told us that they can't release it because the report's not finished. So they're saying the report's not finished, but yet yes. now they've found the fishing industry guilty? Yes. The reality here is this is what happens, going back to the 2006 Act, when you construct legislation that keeps arm's length away from political accountability, 
And whether we like it or not, politicians are elected to represent the public. And when you set up an agency that's arm's length from the public, what you're effectively doing there is isolating the right of the public to information. And this is a classic example of a report or other, or perhaps a combination of reports that was furnished to the EU Control Authority that has led to a cataclysmic decision to cancel the whole regulatory system of the Irish fishing industry, of how we can land catch to our processing plants, to our peers, harbours or exporters. And it has led to a virtual collapse within one hour on the afternoon of the 16th of April, when we were told as representatives of the various fishing bodies that your control plan is gone by five o'clock. And that was just 30 minutes after the point in time that we were told that this was happening. So there was no advance warning. There was no, there was no transition period. So why did that happen? Well, that has happened because our, our, Regulatory Authority, which is the Sea Fish and Protection Authority, is set up with the intention of being arm's length from politicians. That's the design of the animal. And that was allowed to be done. And that means we as citizens, we as processors, the producers, have no rights. That seems illogical, it seems crazy in the current climate that we're in, but we don't have any rights. And that was done in the context that it was a positive development. We saw the consequences of that in terms of the financial crisis with the financial regulator. We're experiencing it even today in terms of the building control regulator. So how many times has something to fail in different aspects of Irish society until we realize that all legislation of a similar nature needs to be repealed? So obviously the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority that was set up under the Act of 2006, that needs to be appealed because we were thrown into a situation within an hour that a sector that's worth 1.1 billion to the economy, employing 16,400 people, was literally thrown under the bus. And like any sector that would be in a similar circumstance, you would go to the politicians of the day, the government of the day, and the reply from the minister of the day, it wouldn't happen in any other sector. But it did happen in fishing. But the reply of the Minister of the Day is, that's a matter for the Sea Fishing and Protection Authority. I can do nothing. You know, if this was dairy, do you think the Minister for Agriculture, who happens to be the same individual, would say, I can do nothing, folks, be with you, get out the door? It wouldn't happen. But we, for some reason, going back to the points that I was making earlier about 48 years of membership of the EU, we for some reason, despite the fact that we're a maritime nation, despite the fact that we're an island nation surrounded by water, valuable water, we are continuously accepting lesser standards for fishermen of all walks of life in the sector. We are, we are not appreciating the true value of fishing. We didn't in 1973 when we joined the EU, and very few days since have we appreciated the value of the Irish fishing industry. It's the first sector that will be sold out. It's the first sector that in this terms, you have the minister of the day saying, my hands are tied. It's, when someone will look at this video in 10 years time, they'll hopefully be saying, was it that farcical? Was it that unbelievable? Because between now and the next 10 years, I'm hoping that some fine day, a minister will arrive in the department with backbone and just weed all this nonsense out and put us on an equal stand with our Danish colleagues, our French colleagues and our Spanish colleagues. Because I travelled all those coastal states and I see the divergence in how European regulations and directives are interpreted in those countries and how they're over-interpreted in this country. And a matter of fact, they'll even go as far in this country as to put an interpretation of their own that's neither based in fact our law. And what is wrong there? What is wrong there is we do not appreciate or respect the fishing sector and that we have an inbred culture that has developed over a long period of time that has allowed that to happen. 
and the need for renewal and the need for repeal and a new direction is never more obvious now, in the, particularly in the period since the Brexit deal. That has to be the final straw. There's no more that we can give. And it is now that the sector needs to unite and stop running down the traditional rabbit holes that those in the Northwest or the Southwest or the Southeast or myself as processors would do. It's time to get out of the rabbit holes and tog out on the level playing field and fight the one fight facing the one direction with the one sole purpose. And that is to reform from the inside out and then take our fight to Europe. I suppose part of that fight that we have to take to Europe is the fact that we call that, you know, um, processors, fishing boats, everything is kind of going down the drain because we're now facing like a tie-up scheme, which is probably going to lead to decommissioning. And, you know, there must be pressure in there as well. Well, I'm a member of the task force, albeit that I joined on meeting four because I wasn't appointed in my post until the 12th of April. The task force, if it does its work right, and if it's allowed to do its work without interference from the usual drags that seem to drag Irish fishing industry backwards, as opposed to allowing it to progress naturally forward. But if the task force comes to the conclusions that's the ambition that's represented around the, the table. I think there's 23 members on it. But if we're allowed to do our job right, the task force should chart a roadmap for the Irish fishing industry for the next critical 10 years. Because the reality up to 2026 is the losses of the TCA Brexit are there. They're going to be a reoccurring reality for producer and processor. So the task force needs to address that loss. And that loss starts with a temporary tie-up scheme for all boats, from inshore to polyvalent to beamers to RSW. Why? Because all those are affected. The task force was established to address those that were most affected by the consequences of fallout of Brexit. So therefore, the catching sector were the first affected party. I've always said that. And there's real and genuine hurt there. And that has to be addressed. So the temporary tie-up scheme, not alone must it be for 2021, and we're late in getting it approved. It was approved this week, despite the fact the task force made that recommendation in July. There's one month of the proposed period already lapsed. So rather than having a tie-up scheme over four months, it's over three months. But that's for 2021. That same tie-up scheme, because the cuts are going to be there for 2022, it needs to be there for 2022, 2023, 2024, five and six. Now the Brexit Adjustment Reserve Fund is only in place until the 31st of December, 2023. So we at task force level need to have a serious argument of where does the gap be filled from for the periods that the bar fund is not in place. But the the tie-up scheme is the first critical step that needs to be put in place. Now, as a processor, as a representative of the processors, I will always have difficulty with a decommissioning scheme, notwithstanding the fact that there is an appetite out there for decommissioning in certain sectors of the catching fleet. But when you decommission, and bearing in mind this will be the third time Ireland has decommissioned in our membership of the EU EEC, but when you decommission, you are seriously jeopardizing the smaller processor. If you look at the BIM figures, 55% of processors in Ireland have a turnover of less than a million. If you're decommissioning fleets, there's lesser vessels catching. Those vessels traditionally, but not exclusively, but traditionally, would supply the smaller processors. That is going to have a massive impact on the processing sector. So a decision or a policy that's implemented for one sector is going to have consequences for the other. So going back to the overarching point that we're talking about here is the task force. If the task force fails in what I outlined earlier, 
and that is charting the ambition and the roadmap for the next 10 years. If we fail in that task, the number of failures within the Irish fishing industry is going to be incalculable. And I'm seriously concerned that referring to the rabbit holes that traditionally allow, that certain people run down, if we go down the same rabbit holes that we've been in and out of for the last 48 years in terms of the ambition of the task force, then we are in for a disaster, a disaster in the Irish fishing industry over the next 10 years. So I'm hoping, even though the final report is not yet drafted, I'm hoping that we have ambition as never witnessed before through this once in a lifetime opportunity of the task force with all parties around the table as equals, charting an agreed course for the fishing industry at all levels, all sectors, big, small and indifferent. If we don't do our body of work right, then we have done the greatest disservice of all to the Irish fishing industry, because on this occasion, we have the funds from Europe, we have the ambition around the table, we have all equal voices there. And it's time that we took responsibility and charted the way forward. Is there other, other areas outside of the fishing industry itself where the Brexit reserve fund could be spent? Well, in reality, the Brexit Reserve is a hotly contested fund. I'm sure the farmers are going to be buying for it. And uh, I'm reliably told that the Minister for Employment wants 300 million of it for training schemes. The Department of Foreign Affairs wants some of it for customs. Everyone wants it. But bear in mind the purpose in which it was established. But if you do a self-assessment on that, and it's important sometimes to be self-critical of what you've heard in the period previous to this, that the ministers from the Thuish down, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Tanishta, and the Minister for Agriculture and Marine, at the time of the bar fund being set up, said that fishing was the most affected sector, that fishing had to get the lion's share of the bar Brexit Adjustment Reserve Fund. How many times have you heard any of those ministers, with the exception of the Minister for Marine, say that? in the last three months. You haven't, because they're all now jockeying and politically manoeuvring to get a chunk of that cake to have as a slush fund in their own department. And this is what is happening right in front of our faces. And we're tied in a task force that's taken longer than, sh than I believe should to put to the department that the Irish fishing industry needs three quarters of this fund. Don't restrict your ambition and don't allow what has happened in everything as I've seen in my lifetime in terms of the fishing sector, the fishing industry. Don't allow ourselves to be dragged back and uh, corralled as a small minority sector. This is the most important sector in terms of the TCA Brexit. We were the sector that was sold out. And that is has to be the primary driver in terms of the recommendations of the task force. Is there anything that we should be looking out for after the uh, end of the task force? Well, th there's a few things and we haven't touched on them. The reality is Michel Barnier said that we're all in this together and no member state would suffer greater than any other member state. That was what he said, that was the policy. He went into this supposed tunnel, which I never believed in my life. I think it's a, a tooth fairy story, but while he was in this tunnel, no one could speak to him, but yet he could take decisions on our behalf. When he went into the tunnel, he looked after France. He, co he was cozy enough to the Belgians, the neighbors. He kicked touch with Spain and he crucified Ireland. He crucified Ireland, he did. There wasn't, we're all in it together, boys, at that point. Uh, unfortunately, in my view, on the 24th of December, we walked away from the table thinking that we got a good deal until someone had the good sense to read the text and discovered that in actual fact, we got the worst deal of all. It took them 11 days to figure that one out. And we are now in a position 
why burden sharing is talked about, burden sharing is on an agenda, but what are the mechanics of burden sharing? If it is what the department wants us to believe, that it's through the negotiation of the next common fisheries policy, which starts in 2023, well, you might as well kiss that goodbye. Because in every review or renegotiation of the CFP since 1983, it's as you were. It's as you were or lose. I have no knowledge of any substantive quota transfers of the nature that we require in order to restore burden sharing to the Irish member state. So we need to avoid that trap. So the mechanics of burden sharing, and burden sharing is a fundamental issue here, because in the interim report of the task force, we said that burden sharing was the primary focus and the primary policy of us as a member state. The minister has said that to be the case as well. But we're in the ninth month after Brexit. Burden sharing is our biggest policy to bring in back the level playing field and equality to the Irish fishing industry. But there isn't one person at department level, at political level, or at any level that can give me two sentences on the mechanics of how burden sharing is going to be sought and how the mechanics of how we're going to go to EU Commission and our member state colleagues, coastal member state colleagues, as to the distribution or redistribution of the existing quotas in order to restore the imbalance and the unjust cut against us. And that's a fact. So what is burden sharing? And nine months later, we shouldn't be at the same, same, exact same point as we were nine months earlier. Isn't burden sharing, the idea of burden sharing, isn't that slightly unambitious? You know, should we not be really getting our politicians, our ministers, our, our government to turn around and say, listen, this whole deal that we were given from the beginning uh, is rotten. Mm. We want something better because we deserve better because we've got 12% of the waters. We, we have been done over so many times. We've decommissioned so many times. And now we're practically left with nothing while other countries are prospering from, from our fishing grounds. Like, I don't think that was, it's that big an ask for, for Ireland as a country to turn around and say, hold on. Because if we were told in the morning that we couldn't export all the beef that we produce in this, in this country, I'm quite sure the government would turn around and say, hold on a second. You can't do that to us. I agree. I agree that the, the, the fundamentals are wrong here. Where do we go back to? Do we go back to 1976 when we were told that we weren't going to go east of the four degree line west? Do we go back to 1983 when basically we were given very menial quotas? Were we given back to the multiple other opportunities where we could have accessed fishing rights in our own waters only to find out subsequently that as a member state that we haven't even applied for quota rights? There's so many injustices. The entire fishing project of the EU and the EEC is flawed. So it's, it's a flawed basis. But the immediate injustice is the TCA Brexit. We were assured of burden share. We were assured before the negotiation started that it was going to be an equal burden for all member states. And no one member state would be hit harder than any other member state. That is what we need to hold them account to. Now, my view was we should have held them to account on that very fact in December 2020, but we missed that boat. But since then, we've been dining out on this principle of burden sharing. But we're at a juncture now where we should have a clear roadmap to what burden sharing is. We should have clear sight to mechanics of how it's going to be delivered, sorry, how it's going to be sought and then how it's going to be delivered. But there's none of that. There is typical of what you get from the Department of the Marine, if you're that way inclined as to listen to the Department of the Marine, it's typical of them. They'll talk vaguely about the CFP. They'll talk vaguely about a negotiation there and a negotiation here, like you or I would have a niche on occasions, but there's no specifics. And here we are as a nation that's been hit for 44 million, 
when in actual fact, the most we should be hit for is 17 million. Now, if I went to any producer or processor and said, look at, we're currently carrying 44 million of losses here, that could be reduced to 17 million. They would take the two hands off you and say, let's have that. And that's what we're living in the expectation of eventually getting. But what the point is that I'm saying, Notwithstanding all the injustices of 48 years of missed opportunity and lost opportunity and poor management and poor policies, notwithstanding all that, those are all factual. But at this point, on the very specific, if we're to do anything with self-respect as a member state, then surely we can do something that within the last 12 months was promised to be a fact that no member state would carry a burden greater than any other member state. Surely at this stage, we can hold the EU to account on that very point, regardless of how thick the walls were in this tunnel that they ended up going into that seemed to have only one policy. And the policy was, let's screw the Irish one more time. Five, six years time, we don't see any reforms. Where will the Irish fish processing industry be? So notwithstanding all the issues that has occurred in the last 48 years, and including in that the, the massive hit that we have had in, in Brexit, the, the one constant is that the necessary reform has never happened at department level or at European level. That, you know, objectively, if you would look at what has happened to the Irish fishing industry in the context of the membership of the EU, if that were to happen in France, if that were to happen in Spain, Portugal, right over to Malta, Greece, do you think that absolutely everything would stay and remain in place? It wouldn't. You know, fundamental questions that have, that have to be asked of why we have gone down this cul-de-sac for after 48 years of membership of the European project, that Ireland is a nation state with 12% of the EU waters, the largest EU waters, yet a minuscule share of quota, including the minority status in their own water that surrounds the island. How that has happened, you know, that fundamental debate hasn't started. It should have happened years ago. It hasn't started. But as I say, this can't continue much longer. It may limp on for another year or two, but there will come a point at a critical point that will trigger this and you will have real political engagement. I don't know what political party is gonna lead out on that, but there's a massive opportunity right across the marine sector, right across the island uh, that we've never tapped on, aquaculture process and producing that needs to be developed and has potential for development but those stumbling blocks that are consistently there need to be dealt with and that we need a whole new modus operandi, starting at our own department, continuing on in how we interact and engage with our EU coastal state members and the commission. That needs to happen. Why does that need to happen? That needs to happen because the status quo has failed. It didn't fail just at December. It's a successively failed year on year for the last 30 years but no one is brave enough to say it. But the reality can only be hidden for so long. The reality then is stronger than any force that can suppress it. And I think we're approaching that. And I saw that visibly, I saw that tangibly, as opposed to be more correct, in Dublin, when I saw three and four different generations from respective families march. They marched. Yes, in frustration, there was frustration there, but they marched with a resolve and a confidence in the future, that it is a future worth fighting for, and they were there to fight for it. In many ways, as one of the representatives of the fishing bodies, I think we did not uh, build on that as constructively and as positively as we should. We've reverted back to the traditional methods of engaging with the department and or the minister and the various political parties. That was not what I got from the streets of Dublin or the port in Dublin as I marched over to the convention centre. I got the confidence resonating from the people that you people that are charged with the responsibility of the Irish fishing industry, get your act together and go a route that you have never gone before and don't let us down this time. But doing a self-critical analysis of it, I'm not convinced that we did those people that marched justice.
Do we need more action, more physical action like protests? Yes, we do. No question about it because we have a minister who tells me he's listening, but I keep telling him he's not hearing what we're saying. He's a personal friend of mine. I, I have great respect for Charlie. Those of you that know me from my previous life, I'd be of a similar persuasion to Charlie politically. Of course, I'm apolitical now. But the reality is, until we see a physical, we're not doubting Thomas is here now, but we need to see a physical change in direction and a real and meaningful uh, policy that will direct the Irish fishing industry beyond the next critical 10 years until we see that. I know at the minute, if we pose those questions, the standard political answer is the task force are dealing with them matters. And it would be inappropriate of me to address it until the task force makes a recommendation. But I'm putting them on an early notice, on early notice that the task force is coming to recommendation stage. And we will be holding you and the successive parties of government that is Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and the Greens, to account. It's on your watch now that Brexit negotiations happen. It's on your watch that the first steps in the realignment and the readjustment that's necessary and urgently needed in fishing will occur or not occur, if that is the case may be. And we need to remain positive. So I will say that it will occur, but it'll only occur if there's fundamental change. And change is a word that's overused but a change is a word that's urgently required in the fishing industry because we haven't seen it. We haven't seen it for 30 years. All we've seen is regression and retrograde steps and backward steps and cuts and further cuts and restrictions and more restrictions. We have never experienced change, but we're at a stage where change is the only door left open to us. And if it's not open to us by the political powers and by the respective powers in, in, the, in the coalition government, if that door is not opened, then we're standing on a floor that's going to collapse under us in decimation. Brendan, it's been fantastic speaking to you today. Um, will you come back and speak to us once the task force report has come out? I most definitely will. And you can almost guarantee I'll have a view or two to express. <laughs> well, thank you, Brendan, for your time today. Thank you very much.